for another episode of Dialogues with me, Richard Reeves. This one was a real treat. I got to speak to my old editor, Oliver Berkman, he used to edit me when I wrote for The Guardian. He is a Guardian columnist or former Guardian columnist himself and a, a recovering productivity guru, I would say. He's written many books on life hacks, productivity hacks, etc. Uh, we talk about his new book, 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals, uh, in which, to some extent, he departs from his previous focus on how to get more out of our time uh, and instead change our relationship with time. He now writes that productivity is a trap. Becoming more efficient just makes you more rushed. Clearing the decks simply makes them fill up faster again. He he had a moment of epiphany sitting on a park bench in, in Brooklyn and also since becoming a, a father has really change the way he thinks about the passage of time and, and our relationship uh, with it. And although I accuse him jokingly of being uh, doom and gloom, actually the the recognition of our own finitude that we're all going to die and relatively soon is actually incredibly liberating. And it frees us in particular to give up on the myth of the stress-free future where we finally get on top of everything, allows us to embrace the discomfort of failure, to focus on on the present, without trying to squeeze a transcendental moment out of it and make more thoughtful trade-offs. I love his um, idea of being um, of strategic failures, just deciding there are certain areas where we need to, to fail. And maybe even at its most radical to embrace the idea of time using us rather than the other way around. So along the way, we talk about uh, parenting, religion, to-do lists, hiking, his uh, his experience of the Northern Lights, which was amusing, the role of things like the Sabbath or being in the same groove in terms of time, and, and lots more along the way. So I hope you enjoy it too. But Oliver, welcome to Dialogues. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, it's an honour for me because you used to be my editor. So way, 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 way back when. Uh, you, you Obviously, you're a former Guardian columnist, but I was also writing column in the Guardian. And for at least, I don't know, I guess a couple of years, you had the dubious pleasure of having to edit my copy like 15 years ago or something more yeah it was it was kind of funny because i did not spend much time at the guardian doing editing um no. i was sort of being trialed out uh on at that point and um i don't know the experience of editing you was so traumatizing that i <laughs> never, never returned to it again i guess is what is what, right. is what the record shows <laughs> that's right well they just said if this is the result actually i think my <laughs> my my column didn't last much longer either so it may just be like the perfect <laughs> the perfect storm between the two of us but uh but, no i was but, never really an editing person because i would i mean it was different with your column because you would come up with your own ideas but when it came to sort of commissioning assigning articles i would come up with an idea assign it like spend the whole day feeling anxious and worried about whether it was going to be what I thought it should be. And then finally it would come in and in a, like half an hour, you'd have to sort of make all the changes. And then I would just think, well, I should have just done all that myself, which is a terrible attitude, but that is, it's the writer attitude, I think. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's sort of like, I could really have done it in less time if I would ended up doing it myself. But well, since then you've, You've established a real reputation as uh, someone who's, I mean, by your own admission in your, in your new book, which we're going to talk about, uh, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. You, you talk, so you're a productivity geek. That's, you, know, you built a successful column and previous books have really tried to look at you know, what you now, I think, disparagingly talk kind of life hacks, getting better at productivity, how to, how, you know, what's the best to-do list. And, and I think a lot of us have this sense that we're just one productivity app away from actual productivity or that there is this future moment where we'll get our act together. Uh, and I see your previous work as a critical consumer of that literature, but nonetheless a consumer of it. And this latest book is really a bit of something of a departure. And you, you describe a, a moment sitting on a park bench in Brooklyn, which I think was sort of an, an epiphany for you in terms of how you think about time, which led you into a much more a much deeper examination of time. So before we get into the the detail, what happened on that that park bench? Yeah, I mean, this was a it was an it was a kind of an intellectual epiphany. I don't think my life changed uh, that that moment, but I it was a sort of a linchpin. I was, you know, uh, it was a winter morning. I would have been on my way between. Uh, our apartment in Brooklyn and the co-working space where I was, you know, uh, doing my work. Stopping and 
thinking forward about the number of things that I had to do that day, which was sort of unusually large um, and felt unusually overwhelming instead of just pretty overwhelming, like usual. Catching myself in that normal process for me of thinking like, okay, what cunning combination of scheduling strategies and Pomodoro techniques and time blocks can I use today to uh, power through this kind of improbably long list? And just having one of those moments where you're like, hang on, none of this is ever going to work. Like this is the, this must be the hundredth or thousandth permutation of these kind of um, tricks uh, that, that I've tried. And, you know, so far, there is no reason to believe that it's ever going to lead to this moment of uh, this kind of uh, time of this sort of future phase of, of serenity and, and feeling calmly in control of, of everything. And I think that's what, you know, this is a specific uh, kind of neurosis. It's my hangups, but I think there is a sort of a universal point here about that a lot of what we're doing in life when it comes, especially to time is, is it's all premised on this notion that the, going to usher in a golden age soon in our lives when um when we're finally going to have things in, in working order and uh and and not have to sort of worry about dropping balls and mm-hmm. disappointing people and failing to achieve our ambitions things like that so just con- confronting the reality of our inevitable failure in, in some ways i wonder if you think that that's i mean obviously you found a huge uh, huge audience for this for this message and i would count myself among them but i wonder if there's a bit of a selection problem here in the sense that the sorts of people who need to read your book are of a particular kind i mean i just notice myself when i'm around other people that they don't seem to have this same sense of the unforgiving minute this same sort of I don't, this this who knows where it comes from, whether it's a personality, but I watched, I just had, you know, we had relatives over for Thanksgiving, for example. And it's even true of like one of my kids as well. I watched their relationship with time and I'm just like, how can it take you an hour to do that? What's wrong with you? Or how can you think that two hours just sitting there doing nothing is a good, like, so is this a universal message, do you think? Or is this a problem for people like you and me? I mean, almost by definition, we're a self-selected group of people, right? And the people reading your book and having you on podcasts and so on are probably the kind of people who've got some sort of, drive or it monkey on their back or something or or do you think it's more universal than that well i'm sure there's a selection bias in terms of the specific ways that i'm articulating this and i'm if it's a selection bias that causes people to find this book then i'm happy about that kind of (laughs) bias right if it's i thought you were going to say that the people who need this might not encounter it because they're too fixated on uh finding the next time management technique i do think that the uh, at the most fundamental level of this, I think I'm making a, I'm trying to make a, a universal claim about how uncomfortable it makes us to be, uh, to be aware of our finitude, of our limited nature as beings, right? Both our limited quantity of time and the fact that we can't really exert very much control over how time unfolds, that you never know what's going to happen from one moment to the next if you're really honest about it. Um, and I think that is universal. I think that um, a sort of neurotic approach to time management and productivity is one way in which we end up trying to defend against that, trying to sort of build these emotional defences against feeling the reality of our situation. Because you get to think that if you're always just a month away from having all your stuff in perfect working order, then that's when you're going to be sort of implicitly limitless and uh, sort of godlike with respect to your time and, and no longer have to feel uh, uncomfortable about all the tough choices that are necessitated by our limited time and all the lack of control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think something, I think people are responding to that in some ways, it's almost any it, it sort of very different personality. So I think like somebody who is very ostentatiously committed to being spontaneous and totally ungoverned by schedules and um, lists that that's someone who looks like the polar opposite of me who's kind of obsessed with schedules and lists but I think they're doing the same thing which sort of railing against what it feels like to sort of confront the truth of uh, our limitations and that sort of that kind of ostentatious spontaneity is a kind of is an attempt to sort of cheat that I think um, 
you know, I think there are people who are just more zen about time. I don't want to suggest everyone is as screwed up as everyone else. And it sounds like uh, the child of yours that you mentioned there might, at this point in their lives anyway, just be quite peaceful with respect to time. But I don't think it's only productivity geeks who are sort of railing against limitation, because I think ultimately that is like humans railing against mortality and we're all doing it on some on some level in some way. Yeah, it's very interesting that you just use the phrase godlike to describe this this sense of trying to get power over everything to defeat death to control everything and it almost you could argue that it's maybe a consequence of the falling away of some aspects of religious life which were a, a sense of humility a sense of not being in control of our lives not being our own we didn't determine to be to be born and so on and so and it's interesting to me that krista tippett who's a an orthodox um a podcast host who I really like um, quote was was in your your uh, I think she was one of your blurbers and so on and so I just wonder to what extent you will I'd like to talk a bit about religion a bit later but do you think that part of the problem here is the post the post religious societies are ones in which we have taken on this sense of having to be almost like gods ourselves in control of our time defeating death living forever etc and then and lost some of the humility and recognition of our limitation that comes with religion. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I'm not necessarily great at articulating it. This, I definitely have had some really interesting communications with with sort of primarily Christian people um, about the sort of religious implications of this way of thinking. Yeah, so some of it's sort of specific, and we can maybe talk about that, you know, the ways in which... Um, religious traditions tend to enforce kind of collective rhythms of time over people and to push back against this notion that, that we ought to be the sort of sole little dictators over our time and how important it is to be able to sort of surrender to some of those rhythms. But just more generally, right? I mean, yeah, the, the, the idea, I suppose, that emerges in the most broad brush way from religion is that, you know, the the job of being infinite and godlike is, is already taken. It's not for it's not for humans to um, aspire to. And yeah, I suppose one way of looking at what we do when we get into that sort of groove of trying to dominate everything is is that we are that can only sort of flourish in a situation where you where you don't feel yourself to be a little sort of pinprick of finitude in the midst of something infinite, but you actually think you might be able to kind of encompass the 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 whole thing yourself um mm. yeah there's a there are other ways of taking that you know my book is all about the idea of being very finite and on some level many religious people believe that we ultimately are not so you know it goes off in in mm. different directions but well yeah. it can it, you're right it can be a different kind of trap but you point this out that if you think that what matters is what happens in the afterlife then that completely changes your relationship to the current life and we could have a we could have a theological debate about whether that's the correct version of time uh, the correct certainly even the correct christian christian message of time i would say that it's it's not and that actually there's this book by this woman nicole rockas called time and despondency yeah. Wow, you know I never book? thought that, that. Yeah, I came across that randomly, and uh, after writing this book, sadly, and uh, of course. blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great, isn't it? And she she talks about this this the ancient idea from from the desert fathers of despondency, and actually that being the result of actually either living in the past or in the future, mm. and rather than kind of embracing in the present. And I think that Nicole's theology of time is much better than some of the more recent Protestant versions of time, which are about predestination and and the afterlife. And so on. So I think there's a there's a whole theology of time that that you that you definitely speak at um, a little bit. Actually, just while we're I think while we're in this space, it's just worth mentioning that the the value of synchrony and rhythm. Uh, actually, I had Joseph Henrik who writes about weird cultures mm. on my podcast earlier, and he was talking about the role of religious ritual and and, and music's hugely important to it. But so is synchrony. So the the shared saying of words. Uh, and of shared kind of music is a hugely important part of religious ritual. It's probably I should say at this point that I've I'm now an Eastern Orthodox Christian. And wow, I did not know that. Wow. No, well, it's no, it's, it's probably I, no one. Like, that, I, guess. I was going to say everybody's doing it, but that sounds like I'm cheapening something about really? your change. No, but I no, I keep stumbling across people who are doing this. 
Paul King's North is the most recent one that springs to my Yes, but, um, I think I, might, I, I may be operating a selection bias myself here. So, you, know, you may be, but it's interesting. Well, if you're like me and you think that, you know, there's this kind of say, this saying that, you know, I'm spiritual but not religious. And I always think that gets it completely the wrong way around and that it's much more important to be religious than it is to be spiritual. Uh, although I think, of course, you have elements of both. And I think part of that is this sense of, of synchrony, of there being a seasonality. Like you, you enter liturgical time. And one of the things I discovered straight away with Orthodox services, they're incredibly long and incredibly repetitive. And you should never even wear your watch into that or certainly never look at your watch. I mean, the, the idea of looking at your watch during one of these services is kind of insane because you do enter a different kind of time and you repeat the same prayers and it's the same music. And even now I can sort of hear some of the songs, kind of mm-hmm. some of the prayers like going around and around in my head. And it is, I think, this sense of timelessness and entering into this, this shared synchrony you you i think you share in your book that you're you're in a community or you have been in a choir mm-hmm. uh, uh you also do community work and so on and i wonder if to some extent you're trying to construct some of the elements that get packaged together in religion oh, uh, absolutely. in your own way yeah no absolutely i mean um i do neither of these things right now because we relocated to the north york moors and in that way you're you're in touch with rhythms in a different way but at the moment I'm not in a choir and I'm not at the Park Slope Food Co-op, which is, I think, maybe the other thing you're referencing there, where you sort of, you know, you do these kind of, uh, that sort of shift work is uh, hauling boxes of vegetables around. I'm not sure it matters all that much what the specifics are. But um, no, completely. I mean, I am frequently now reading pieces of religious writing where I think like, if only I could believe the part that I think you probably do on some level need to believe, I'd be all in. But I, mm. I, I currently can't. So, um, well, that's, but no, I think that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's part of the question, I think. is I talked to Joe a bit about this, which is like, can, can religions do the job of religions without, the sort of, without some of the supernatural beliefs? Or how far do you have to have the supernatural beliefs for them to, you know, do, they, do they work as a technology? <laughs> Otherwise, I think that is quite a, an interesting question to, to, to dive into. But I do notice a lot of people trying to assemble the elements of it. Um, and I do yeah. think also the other thing that religions do and I'd be interested in your views on this because I think you steer clear of regulation and I'm sort of bouncing around here. I want to get back to some of the central points. of the yeah. book. But, but one of the points I think you make is that there is value in time away from paid labor, especially taken together. So there's a collective action problem. You quote this fascinating Swedish study, which I don't know if you can remember, but if you can oh, about, yeah. I think it's Uppsala. Am I remembering yeah, there's that correctly? This, there's this fascinating work out of um, Sweden that, that suggests that, um, Basically, they they looked at the patterns of when people were on holiday, vacation in um, in Sweden, and they looked at the patterns of uh, antidepressant prescriptions being filled as a kind of a proxy for how happy people were feeling. And they they discovered that the more um, the the greater the proportion of the Swedish population is that is on vacation at a single time, the happier individual people are. Um, which is, and they call it collective restoration. And, and it's, um, you know, it's this very striking finding that suggests that we, that we sort of replenish ourselves and find pleasure in our surroundings and the rest of it in a sort of collective as a, as a, as a group. But it's also interpretable in some very mundane ways, right? I mean, if, you're, if everyone is off work uh, at the same time, then you don't need to worry about your email inbox filling up while you're away or people trying to steal your job while you're away or take credit for your work or something. Um, If everyone's off at the same time, you know, the chances are much higher that your friends who you really want to go to the beach with are free to go to the beach rather than it's just not their annual leave week that that week. Um, So there's all sorts of very mundane explanations for this effect. But um, yeah, it's it's it, it. The interesting thing is it's so it goes against the sort of uh individualistic, for want of a better word, kind of neoliberal uh, ethos that we should all ultimately be the, be the dictators of how we use our time and when we, when we do things. But it also sort of goes against lots of things that I want to be very, I think, of great, like, you know, flexible work from home, family-friendly work policies, all this stuff, things that you wouldn't want to, or I wouldn't want to become a, an opponent of, um, but what they do all have the effect of doing is kind of, yeah, is, is busting apart these, 
these rhythms that would otherwise prevail where people are all together in a place working and then all the way at roughly similar times and, and all the rest of it. So it's difficult because you're always, I mean, it, this is the constant problem, right? With trying to figure out what is good in traditions that are eroding is that you don't necessarily just want to go back to the time when the traditions were uh, strongly enforced and there were lots of other bad things <laughs> happening for lots and lots of people and demographics. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I struggle a bit with this too, because as a sort of liberal of the John Stuart Mill variety myself, you know, I've always tended to the view that Sunday trading laws or imposed religious holidays and so on did, did, did run against this idea of individual autonomy. And for someone else to impose upon you when you should and shouldn't be doing something is fundamentally illiberal. Mm -hmm. And especially if they do so in the name of religion, like the idea that I can impose, like a legally imposed Sabbath. But then what's interesting about it is that in the UK, of course, where you are back now, no one has a problem in a way. I don't think many people have a problem with the religiously Im imposed holidays, even if they don't. I mean, how, I don't right. think that many people in the UK are going to church on Easter Sunday, but the Easter weekend or the Whit Sunday weekend or the Christmas week and so on still seem to be largely quite positive. So this is a relic of religiously imposed um, vacations. And I guess that you're in favor of those. My guess would be that if there was a bill in the House of Commons to get rid of them as an outrageous infringement on individual liberty, you'd probably support them, wouldn't you? You'd probably keep them. Yeah, I think so. I had really, yes. I mean, yes. I, I, I don't, th I, I, that, that's just a sort of instinctive reaction. But yeah, no, no, I don't think, um, I don't think there's any reason to think that the specific legacy of tradition in a specific country. I mean, it's not, it's not my experience of having of any conversation I've ever had with someone from a, from a re non-Christian religious background in Britain that they, that they're offended by Christmas holidays or anything like that. Right. Not, not at all. Um, they, in fact, one of the things that happens is you get these kind of fantastic alternative traditions rising up around them, like the, like, Jewish Christmas Day traditions in New York City, which I've participated yeah. in, and which are some of the most fun yeah. things you'll, you'll ever everyone do. Goes, everyone yeah. goes out for lunch, don't yeah. they? It's a fantastic day out yeah. because all the Christ, all the Christians are safely tucked away at home. Chinese food and the movies. It's brilliant. It's, it's fantastic. And um, and um, so no, I don't. Yeah, I think that's that's not the the way to do it. I mean, the, the the problem constantly at this sort of societal level with the stuff that I'm writing about in the book. A lot of the book, I should say, is just about like how do how can a person on an individual level? Yes, I know. We will get to some of that. Don't think worry. about their time in a way that you know finding themselves in in the society in which we find ourselves. But but then but I am very interested in the stuff about the sort of policy side of this and and how you could make things saner. And yeah, you're constantly at the risk. Well, the people who did the Swedish study that you that you brought up? He, he, the, the lead author does basically say, you know, we the, we probably just need more social regulation of time. We probably need, um, to, yeah, Sunday trading laws or uh, um, thinking of these uh, slightly misreported, I think, but slightly some of these EU corporate rules about not sending emails uh, to employees of big companies after a certain time of day and things like this there's all sorts of you know and it, and it, yeah there's enough i'm enough of a i'm enough of a libertarian which is not very much but i'm enough of one to not like that on some level you know the idea that some some authority the outside of me ought to tell me when i can yeah if the I wanna, state is gonna t the state wanna, is gonna tell you right if i want to yeah. spend sunday morning doing my shopping or answering my emails it ought to be up to me yeah so it's a it's a conflict that's why I think actually this sort of softer forms of regulation, which you get through adherence to tradition rather than state kind of imposed, um, becomes more more attractive in, in some ways, I think, because you're not it's not necessarily legally mandated. But it's interesting. I think also I also think that civic authorities can do a good job of flexing with this. I'm thinking about the fact that my kids went to high school in, a, in Bethesda, Maryland, which is uh, quite a heavily Jewish area. And there would be on, on all the major Jewish holidays would be the schools would close mm -hmm. 
but they didn't close because it was a major Jewish holiday. They closed because, quotes, it was a good day for teacher training or right. whatever the equivalent was. But it's like re- reliably every year you could see these days and you could line them up against the Jewish right. holidays and you could say, oh, by an amazing coincidence, Montgomery County has yet again shut its schools for all the Jewish holidays. Right. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic because what they're recognizing was a significant proportion of their students and therefore families were going to want to celebrate those holidays mm-hmm. maybe they wouldn't some of them wouldn't come to school anyway or they'd be conflicted so just fine let's just close all the schools yeah and and actually back to your point about the christians none of the christian families or secular families but generally minded you know it was yeah. well flagged in advance it was another day and you would just take the time and so i i think there are various ways in which you can bridge some of that gap between the civic and the the religious maybe Let's go back a little bit because um, we've got to deviate down some of the stuff that I'm super interested in. Maybe no, come fascinating, back to it. Though. really fascinating. And kind of c- confronting our finitude, which is the um, which is the sort of central th- the theme of your book. And so you're sort of like C-3PO uh, from the Star Wars movies, just going around saying we're all doomed, <laughs> uh, essentially through the, through the through the book, which which I think is true. I mean, it's true. It's basically true, and it's very important. And and I also think you know many people do have experiences. Uh, I certainly had personal experiences being, you know, with someone very, you know, it's actually in my case, my sister dying and I was with her at the time. And that's just like these moments where the finitude becomes sharper and you talk a little bit about that and you're trying it. You say you want to get to a point where you don't have to have that kind of personal brush. You know, very, and most of us, I think one or the other have had, have had some kind of mm. experience of death or illness and so on without having to, without ideally without having to have that kind of, moment and the result of recognizing our finitude it seems to me that there are three i'm summarizing a little bit some of your thesis so tell me if i'm getting steering you wrong but uh, and then we'll go into each of them one is i think the value of that is that first of all recognizing you're never going to get everything done secondly living more in the present and we can unpack that because mm-hmm. that could go that could be misdescribed and then and thirdly recognizing trade-offs and and op- opportunity costs etc so recognizing that there's a so th- those are the sort of th- some of the key themes that emerged for me, which I thought we could use to structure the remainder of our conversation. Have I missed anything big? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I I do see them all as um, different expressions of this this sort of basic attempt to kind of get outside of life, you know, to sort of get to sort of um, find a find a. a uh, a break clause in the contract of being a human being, you know. It's a, so yeah, no, I think they're all they all speak to the yeah. to the point here. So there's the first one is like you're back to your Brooklyn uh, park bench of recognizing you're never going to get anything done, recognizing you just it's like it's just impossible. There's mm-hmm. that that makes you think. There's that mo- Michael Keaton movie, Multiplicity, where he clones yeah. himself. Yeah, do you know that? Uh, um, I'm not going to so, claim I've seen it. So, so busy that he ends up to, he, cre- he, cl- he finds a way to clone himself so he has one that stays home and looks after his kids and is nice to his wife he has another one that's running his business he has another one that's doing his doing his yard work he has another one and, it, and, and then they all end up arguing with each other so it's all these different selves just kind of arguing with each other but that, i think that's part of it isn't it that the, in some ways the biggest myth of all that you're trying to confront here is the idea that there is a future in which I'm on top of things, that I will finally be able to relax. I will finally have cleared the decks. Zero. You're a zero inbox person. You, you, I don't know if you still are, but that, that whole idea of like, yeah, then I'll be able, then I can relax. But of course that, that day never comes, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is, I mean, I think, again, I think it is a particular manifestation of a, of a human hang up, but to, to, to sort of think about this in terms of productivity and time management. But I think there is something really deep going on in that feeling, in that, uh, that feeling of wanting to get on top of everything, get, get everything in working order, get to this point, basically where you wouldn't have problems, right? It's the sort of breakthrough to a, to a phase of life, where you're, you're sort of in command, you're sort of the, the air traffic controller of, of everything that's uh, going on in your life and you never feel on the back foot and you never feel like you're sort of experiencing this, this discomfort of having to, yeah, make choices and accept defeat on, on certain things. And so, yeah, just on the level of to-do lists, a completely mundane level, I mean, that's where I'm sort of wanting to point out, you know, firstly, there's just no reason to assume that uh, the, the, the list of things that matter to you 
will naturally fit snugly inside the temporal resources you have because we are these kind of hugely limited material uh, creatures with the mental capacity to basically think about infinity so you can you can there's always another um thing you can want to do or obligation you can feel or ambition you can have or you know email you can get sent no reason to believe that you can get through everything that feels like it matters that's just a sort of arbitrary assumption and then a bunch of reasons why actually it's getting worse that 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 those inputs um whether they come from inside us or from from others are more numerous in the Tech, this technological era and then this whole ironic thing i call the efficiency trap where actually trying to get through it all and get on top of it generates more of it parkinson's law about work expanding to fill the time available is an obvious example of that there are lots of others um so the condition that we're in these days i think is of um wanting to get to the wanting to get our arms around everything but the everything is bigger or feels potentially bigger than it has ever been and our means for getting our arms around everything are getting more efficient which is actually increasing the size of the everything as well i mean that's that's the basic point so it's just yeah it's it's impossible yeah and you're trying to get away from the idea i I think you're trying to get away from the idea that in the end you will be more productive by trying to be well, I don't know, actually. Where do you land on this? Because it's in some ways, I think you're critical of some of the time management th- theories that are based on, in the end, this is still going to make you more productive. You have this great story about these two different organizations that I have i didn't make a note of, but the time off conference. You went to a time off conference somewhere with all these oh, yeah, people hanging yeah. out over the weekend saying we should have more time off. And then there's another competing organization. And their view is basically we should all just be able to be lazy and get away from the capitalists ethos right. and there's right. another yeah. and there's another group saying no 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 flexibility and time off is good for productivity right. right so there is there are two different arguments here one is yes actually we should be in favor of paid leave and more vacation and flexible working and weekends off and so on because that will make our workers more productive and there's another which is no 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 you're still falling into the trap of saying that productivity is the end goal i'm not entirely clear where you land on that because i think at some points you seem to suggest that by doing things the way you suggest, which we can get into a little bit, limiting the number of things you do, you will actually end up being more fruitful and more productive. Or are you abandoning the idea of what you produce being any kind of measure at all? It's a really good question. No, I don't think I am, although I, it's not, I, I don't promise that I am completely clear in the book on this topic. I mean, I, I sort of default to these concepts like sort of meaningful productivity, the idea that what matters, I, I do assume that what matters in life is to some extent, is doing things, but just not doing things the greater the quantity, the better. Um, uh, that there's no intrinsic benefit in doing a thing unless it's um, a thing that matters to you for some for some reason. Um, but it's not a sort of counsel of aspiring to some kind of state where you never felt the need to do, to do anything. And therefore, yeah, absolutely. I think techniques that um, focus your attention and your time on, on, on the things that matter the most to you and get them done are bona fide productivity techniques. And I'm not like, I can't, um, I can't honestly say that I think that that's a bad thing. Where I get into the thought that it might all be a bad thing i suppose is when i'm talking about the idea of sort of emotionally over investing in this instrumental attitude to time right and taking this Mm. perspective that the only reason the the only measure of whether you're using an hour well is is what it leads up to um and whether it's successfully um building towards a goal and i'm kind of maybe this is hedging but i'm kind of careful there in the book to say like you have to use time instrumentally all the time to just to live. It, that's not the p- problem. The problem is is the locating of all the value of life in that um, uh, in, in the future. So, so it's again, you know, I, it it's not that it's not that there isn't some meaning of the idea of being productive that isn't worth or being more productive that isn't worth aspiring to. 
it's more that the ways that we have internalized and maybe the ways that the economy benefits from it, but we don't benefit from as individuals, that those are the wrong definitions of mm. productivity. I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling at this point. It's interesting. No, I, 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 there's this interesting idea of like a, you're getting, it produces through the act of consuming in some ways. Um, and even that, I think to talk, call it a consumption good probably undervalues it. I'm thinking about family and parenting and so on and some, some work some colleagues of mine have done around the idea of kind of parenting as a consumption good mm-hmm. as opposed to an investment good. So something that you do because you you want to do it, not because you're producing some value. You know, you're, and you have this l- nice stuff thing about childhood. And we'll get to how becoming a father changes you, I think, in a moment. But but I'm I'm thinking about a couple of things. One is John Elster's. He's this philosopher, John Elster, who talks about willing things that can't be willed. There's some things that just can't be willed, like kind of I think it's like sleep, orgasm, love, etc. There's things that you can't. There are certain things in like you just no, no matter no matter how much will you put into it, you just can't. You can't make it happen. Mm-hmm. It happens just kind of automatically. And I'm wondering in that spirit whether whether any production value that comes out of the activity that you're engaged in is in some ways and in some circumstances a byproduct rather than the main product so you're you know you've become a, you, you're raising a kid mm-hmm. right if the result of playing with your child and taking them for a walk and so on is that they become more confident in the world or their vocabulary improves or whatever that's a byproduct but it's not the product it's not the purpose of taking them for a walk or playing with them and as soon as you made it the purpose if you said I'm going to play with my kid and play catch and go. I'm going to throw it because that will make them, that will improve their vocabulary and they'll do better in school and then they'll do better in high school. You've completely changed it. And so would that be a fair way to reframe this as in some circumstances? It's, it's, it, it will have a productive result, but that's not the point of the exercise. Yeah, that's not properly the point of the exercise. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, that's, I think that is true. Yes, I'm, I'm not too great at thinking of these things in, in the, terms from economics that's not my that's not sort of my uh background but but yeah i think it that does make sense to me and i think that um we do it all the time right i mean i find that that sort of undertone of is this the right thing to be doing now is like definitely gets in the way of my attempts to be a a a good parent but um and and you might want to say that you could go too far as well, right? You might not want to say that it should never be any part of the point. Um, I, I, the, the, you know, some of the things we do around the kitchen table that involve, our son is five, you know, things that involve sort of like exercise books with letters and numbers in them. There is a, it's fun, it's great, but there is a part of that that is, uh, I think, properly about kind of training. So I don't know where you draw the line the the um the famous analogy that alison gopnik uses between the in her book uh the gardener and the carpenter or the carpenter and the gardener are you familiar with that um no this this idea that you know we've we've come to think of our role as parents as like carpenters building building Mm. a finished product and it makes it's more it makes more sense to think of our, us as gardeners providing and and continuing to nurture the soil in which um, things, plants, children will sort of grow on their own. Um, uh, and you really do have to nurture the soil, but you're not in that kind of control of the product. That, I don't know if that's a get out on the question in terms of, at least in the context that you're asking this question, but to me, that seems like a nice middle way, right? It says like, you do have responsibilities. Some of them are somewhat future focused. Uh, and yet there is a, there is a kind of stepping back in that, in that metaphor anyway, isn't there? Um, mm. a, a sort of uh, not so much a heavy handedness. Yeah, she's trying to find the middle ground, I think. And your your example of the words around the table. So it was like reading reading a bedtime story, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, how old are your kids? Uh, we have one son. He's five. Yeah, five. Yeah. Okay, so you're in uh, you're you're well into the bedtime story phase. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, I you know, I, I, that's a that's a good example, maybe, of something that 
is undertaken largely because it, it it soothes into sleep and it's calming and it's the time together but it also turns out that it increases vocabulary but but i'm gonna i, I think i'm gonna stick to the idea that if you approach that task with the view that the main objective right is to improve your kids vocabulary that it won't it just it won't be a good experience yes absolutely and i'm also quite struck at how um kids intuit these things and um I'm thinking of a moment a couple of days ago when I, I definitely sort of overreached in, in one of these um, sort of letter writing, um, word writing exercises that we were just playing with at the table and something in me became instrumental about it. And almost instantly it was very amusingly and kind of creatively sabotaged by our son. He was having, he was... He was having none of it at that point. I don't mean he threw a fit. I mean, like he started like not following the rules in funny ways. And looking back on it, I'm like, oh, I think on some intuitive level, they know when, when you're, uh, when you're turning it into that. Yeah. When you're trying to bullshit them. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. Oh, my, you know, my basic view having raised three to adulthood now is children know everything <laughs> about everything. <laughs> they don't always necessarily know it, but they know, they know everything mm. they can sense everything and i remember with my kids when we'd, be, we'd have all these bedtime stories that we'd read them and there was one period where the only thing they wanted me to do was to get this small photo album which was like a family photo album with a bunch of photos in it and each and i had to make up a new story using these photos every time uh it's all they wanted it was exhausting because it was using my creative energy but it's all they wanted it wasn't helping their vocabulary at all right um and it wasn't the school work and so on. Yeah, yeah but you've talked you, you write about becoming a father i think that's why i felt able to ask you um about this experience and how that this is the second thing i think about sort of living more in the present that becoming a, becoming a father I, I i quote you let me quote you here it took becoming a father for me to grasp how completely i'd spent my whole adult life up to that point mired in this future chasing mindset so something about becoming a father was also very important so you had the you had a moment in on the brooklyn park bench but you also had a moment mm. as you've been raising your son which has altered your relationship with time can you talk a little bit about how that's how that's happened yeah i mean this this is definitely less of a moment of epiphany and more a sort of gradual realization and still totally a sort of in a struggle on some level but what i actually say after that passage is that um I didn't immediately like become a father and then suddenly I was plunged into the joy of the present moment and never, and never was a weird productivity geek again. In fact, I tried to sort of transfer productivity geekhood onto parenting and bought all these books that were basically useless, but made a good feature for the guardian um, about a year or so later, mm. but um, about how to do it right. And they're all sort of, and I make the point in the book that they're all sort of, they are themselves all future focused, whether or whether they're the kind that um, admit it or the kind that purport to be about something else. But I think, you know, it, it's all like such a cliche, but the experience of, of um, having a newborn or a toddler, for that matter, um, and seemingly it, so far I don't see small childhood being any different, is that the changes... And the transience of each phase of it are so obvious. Um, it's like so much has happened in the last four and a half, five years. It's just, it, it, um, as compared to what I might think had happened in the four or five years previous, you know, um, that it becomes a, a really sort of powerful wake-up call to kind of be there for it and not to... Um, and not to just sort of um, uh, sort of vacuum it all up as part of your plan to for wherever you're getting, you know. Um, now I still like struggle hugely with this, and I'm and I'm uh, I'm constantly torn between like hurrying into the future when it comes to parenting and worrying that I'm going to regret missing things that are happening now and. Um, so you know no no great guruhood here at all but but it but it did have that effect of you know example in the book right if if there is something so absorbing and um and sort of awe inspiring about watching like your first 
child learn how to use the fingers on his hand that when you then catch yourself thinking like well does this show that he's met the correct developmental stage according to this book i was reading it you do it because you're still a screw up but you notice that there's something that you notice this thing that you've presumably been doing all through the rest of life too um measuring and comparing experience seeing where experience is taking you more than experiencing experience it just becomes a lot harder to ignore um for me anyway your own um sort of Mm. strange behavior and that's obviously the first step to um uh, transforming a little bit so that's when your kids are your kids are teaching you i I reminded a conversation i had with my parents about parenting when i talked to them about parenting and they looked at me funny and they said what what do you what what was that word i said parenting (laughs) and they said parenting and my dad said, when did that become a verb? Yeah. And so I had to look it up, of course. And it was, you know, some point in the 70s or what, I think late 70s. And it became, it got verbed like all nouns do eventually. Yeah. But um, my, and I, I said, well, didn't you, well, you were parenting? And they said, no, we just had kids. <laughs> and it was really interesting. It's always stuck with me. It's like, actually, there was, it, within, between the generations, there was a generation that had kids and there was a generation that did, did parenting and, and sort of semi-professionalized it. One of the things I wondered uh about when uh, with one of my kids in particular who who properly has attention deficit disorder not as not not a sort of misdiagnosed one right. but one that actually took us a heck of a long time to properly realize is i felt i felt a little bit it may be too early for you this to some extent we were so having to socialize our kids into a into a way in which time was constructed in the modern world and in the modern economy by schools mm-hmm. and in future workplaces and so on that comes relatively easily to some but much more difficult it with much greater difficulty to others it almost felt with one of my kids i almost and i did, didn't plan to talk about this but I almost felt like we were breaking him yeah the way you break a horse mm-hmm. and he the difficulty had with the idea of school and times and deadlines and so on and from a very early age i took my kids to music festivals and they loved it but this kid in particular just said it was absolutely the best five days or whatever it was of his year every year Mm -hmm. without exception and i came to believe it was because of the relationship with time i came to believe it was because actually the days just unfold at a music festival there is no bell there's no whistle there's no you know you don't eat at lunchtime you eat when you get hungry you run around you listen to the music just Mm -hmm. and i wondered if actually i was those five days at a music festival were the way he thought he should be living and the other 360 days of the year when I was forcing him to get up and go to school and forcing him to go to that practice so on where actually I was just breaking him into a industrialized version of time that actually is in some way unnatural yeah I mean I I think that that resonates a lot I think I don't you know uh our son just began uh reception primary school here in North Yorkshire so um it's all pretty pretty new. It doesn't feel, uh, in his case, like those rhythms that, he, that that he's not made for those rhythms. If anything, I think he's too much like me in in um, attaching to those rhythms. Um, really, uh, which is, is, he, whole, is does he get ready? Does he get ready easily? Is, is he like calling? Is he saying, "Dad, we're going to be late if we don't leave now"? Uh, not usually. He is sometimes. I always. Whenever I hear that kind of anxiety about time from him, I'm like, uh, I'm like, oh no, that's me. That's just me. Totally me. It's definitely not my wife. But um, the, but but no, I think like the rhythm. That there's lots to be said for 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 rhythm as well. So we're back to this kind of like you know, um, uh, middle way thing because I think what you're saying about schools as kind of factories for inculcating the a kind of time that is suited for certain ends but maybe not for the people in in which it's being inculcated is totally true on the other hand i don't know i i can only speak to my own experience of kind of form shapeless multi-day festivals which isn't very great experience very i haven't had much experience but like I, i'm yeah i'm i guess i'm just saying i have a different personality not a very interesting point yeah <laughs> and no i guess i mean the the other point i'm reflecting on my own thing is that i don't regret breaking him to use that analogy again because you know that is to some extent that's 
socialization into the culture you happen to be born into. And so if there's a culture that has a particular version of time, then you know, I, I, if we were in a different kind of society at a different time, I'd be breaking him in a different way. I'd be breaking him to get ready to go hunting or, you know, what, right. and, and so breaking sounds pejorative, but of course what it really meant was just, but you just, you just, you notice in the process how people's attitudes towards time go vary in, in ways that you can't, you can't, you can't predict. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. There's something deep in us that that then sort of interacts with what, what yeah is, with, what is with put our cult. Yeah, yeah. But this you, at this point about li- living in the present can be a real cliche, and you point that out can be the sort of you know I think you say at one point don't roll your eyes and look away. And I must say actually the and as uh, a fellow writer, of course, you you'll hopefully kind of appreciate that that it pains me to say that the book is also exceptionally well written. <laughs> Um, and that not only, not only <laughs> thank you for going, undergoing that pain, Richard. I appreciate it. Thank you. And and that not only that, but I, I noticed that it's been listed uh, on the lists of best self help books and as one of the best philosophy books uh, of the year as well by kind of philosophy buyers. And that's a that that Venn diagram over over the overlap in that Venn diagram between self help and philosophy is probably not occupied by very many books. So. No, I'm very. I just saw that. The, just saw that today before we started yeah. recording the the philosophy thing. That's great. No, very happy. Yeah, and that's Nigel Warburton's people. That's right. That's great. But this this the pressure to live in the moment can also be a different kind of problem, right? There is this sort of sense of people running around. And it's like because you get yourself to a place where you're supposed to be having you're supposed to be having a moment, right? You're supposed mm-hmm. to be like, oh, this is rude. I'm fine, finally. And then it usually disappoints. So you tell this very funny story. So you could probably get on a list of funny books as well, yeah. just to complete the trifecta, <laughs> <laughs> right? where you go and you witness the Northern Lights. Mm. And I don't know if you remember how you recount the story, but it was, oh, yeah. it was very funny and, and very, and I've had similar experience, but it's great. Go ahead and tell that story. Oh, just quickly. I mean, I was on a trip to the Arctic Circle for work for not to see the Northern Lights, but it was one of, you know, I was there for a week and I really, and I really wanted to, to see the Northern Lights and I finally did after a number of nights of failing. Um, and yeah, just this this feeling of trying so hard to think like, okay, now I'm here and I'm seeing the Northern Lights. This is a once in a lifetime experience. I'm going to be in the moment, you know, so powerfully that I sort of popped right out of the moment. And yeah, I mentioned in the book having the, having the thought, um, oh, they look like one of those screensavers, um, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, not a not a good thought to have in the middle of oh, the natural great. natural one of the world. But you know, so the, it, it's just this idea that, like, you know, you, there's something about experiences like that that, when you know you're sort of cued into trying to to trying to find them amazing, that they just that they just won't be. And I actually, yeah, I found sense. that sort of um, in just to get back to our earlier conversation about religion, I'm. I'm sufficiently sort of religion curious as to have gone to a number of different sort of services here and there. And, and up here, there are some completely beautiful, uh, small, small churches where that kind of thing is a, is a really amazing experience and or ought to be a really amazing experience. And I, this thing kicks in again. And I'm like, OK, I'm here now. Time for an experience. It's impossible. Yeah, absolutely. I, I well, kind of feel I, like there's something about very the, the the services you mentioned that is a little bit more like, well, I, this is too rude a way to put it, but you know, sort of boring you into submission in a way. There's something to be said for the three hour <laughs> service. No, no, I, 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 I think most Orthodox would take that as a compliment. <laughs> being bored, being being bored into submission. I think actually that's a very accurate description of the purpose of the divine liturgy, um, because I mean, just you, if, your, your editor's pencil comes out and you're like, didn't 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 we just say this for a prayer? But but interestingly, like, it's there is this. It's a very interesting distinction I think between different kinds of theology because one is one kind of theology is based on how you feel. So it's based on you're supposed to have this moment, right? You have a conversion, you're supposed to you know, feel Jesus in your heart or whatever. There's this, And there's another, which is much more kind of based on it's what you do. Mm-hmm. This is actually, I think, more of a kind of Jewish tradition as right, well, but it's right. certainly kept in the Eastern church. Which is, it's actually, it doesn't matter whether you, what you feel. Right. You can go to a three-hour divine liturgy and take communion and do all, say the prayers and so on and feel absolutely nothing. Yeah, You know, I actually feel bored. Mm-hmm. Or you know, but but you've done it. So so that's so. There's a kind of a ecclesial element to it. Yeah. Um, and then of course, 
it's i think this speaks very much to your work which is the moments of transcendence will come when you're not expecting it when you're out on a walk in the north of yorkshire moors and you see right. a butterfly right. or 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 not that not at the moment in the liturgy where you know the the holy spirit descends but when you see the little boy who's serving at the altar peeping around from behind the candlelit altar and smiling at his mum. right so this is right. not or, or right. whatever yeah. yeah so this is not to say that it isn't ultimately got to cash out in some sort of changed experience because I think if it, maybe this is not true for all religious people, but I mean, you'd have thought that at some point it has got to feel different to be religious than not to be religious in order to be worth being religious, but not in the moments of the, of the, at the sort of heart of the, of, of the, of the process, I suppose. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I think that's, um, that totally speaks to what we're talking about here about trying to sort of be in the moment. It is something that um, if it doesn't happen sometimes, then then like what's the point in anything? But at the same time, trying to bring it about is a surefire way to to make it not happen. So. Yes, yeah, so to use an, uh, maybe to use a parallel from your own experience, you write about hiking uh, in the drizzling rain and so on. And you don't know when a moment will occur and it can be just it's still as if well when it stops raining i'll have a great moment it might be in a moment when it's pouring with rain right, right. yeah all right you can't in other words you can't we can't order it you can't will it back to elsa singing you you can you know transcendence is another thing along with you know sleep and love and orgasm that can't be willed you can't right. will yourself into transcendent right and that is why i mean obviously it's a cliche right the number of times that things happen in people's lives that um are sort of um things failing somehow uh and and those being the memorable moments you know the picnic that is hilariously rained off or these um these people just across the way in the yorkshire dales who have been stuck in a pub for four nights running in the company of an Oasis tribute band um, because uh, the snow made it impossible for them to, to get out. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty obvious that this is going to be something they cherish for the rest of their lives and, it, and you would never have chosen for it to happen, right? So, so. Absolutely. Or it's like those people that during 9-11, their plane got grounded. A massive plane got grounded in Canada, and they ended up yes. going friend- and oh, they go yeah. back every year. Yeah, and right, like, right, you know, right, and, they, yeah. and they, they have a reunion. And yeah. I sort of, I feel like we should. Be, I think you've definitely earned your stripes as a philosopher so far in this podcast episode. But we should better. We should do a little bit more, a little bit more self help. Okay. Um, and this is the third thing: recognizing the trade offs and opportunity costs. Which is, there's a couple of things here you suggest um by way of kind of practical advice so one is to just i think the the broader point is to recognize you won't get everything done but there's a couple of things you suggest like number one is choosing things to fail at kind of bit of art and then secondly putting a hard limit pretty hard limit on the number of things you're working on so could you just say a little bit about the value of each of those yeah so just in to put that in context i mean if there's more that if there's more to do that feels like it matters than you're ever going to get to do then the only way to sort of free yourself up to do a few things that matter is to be okay with the discomfort or the anxiety that that comes from from not getting on top of everything from knowing that you won't uh from just deciding today to do a handful of things that are meaningful in the middle of this kind of landscape of a million other things that you could and maybe should on some level be doing and you just won't and so a lot of these techniques are just sort of ideas to some of them almost sort of trivial, but ways to sort of help you embody that spirit and that willingness to be with that discomfort. So the thing about strategic underachievement, choosing in advance what to fail at, um, which I take partly from the work of an author called John Acuff, um, that's just the idea that if you're going to fail at a whole bunch of stuff, which you are due to being finite, then it then it's a more peaceful way to do that to sort of nominate some of those areas in advance if you decide that um lawn care is just not going to be your thing then it's a lot more it's a lot less dispiriting to see that your lawn has been neglected um if you can sort of tolerate uh, a certain degree of uh domestic 
mess and untidiness because you've decided in advance that that's not going to be the thing that you focus on at least for this for the next few months or something you know um that that can be it can be a very sort of freeing way and you can do it sort of cyclically so you can sort of say for the next few months it's appropriate that i do the least i can get away with in my job because i want to focus on my family life and then there might be a time when it was more appropriate to say well okay i'm not going to do no exercise because that's not healthy but i'm not going to be training for a 10k this quarter i'm just going to be focusing on work and home and and then it's less yeah it's less dismaying to to fail and some form of failure was inevitable that's that's the point it's not Mm. it's not a council of despair because because this was on the cards anyhow um and then the point about limiting work and progress i've just been really this has made a really big difference to my sort of daily working life there's lots and lots of different ways to implement the thought and one of them people can find in a book called personal kanban uh by jim benson and tony ann barry um and others are um scattered all through the literature but uh, sometimes in the middle of books that are quite that i have lots of problems with other on other otherwise but this is just this idea that you It's very tempting to want to multitask on things. It feels like you're getting closer to your goal of getting on top of everything. If you sort of touch 20 projects in the course of a day, you feel like you're taking care of business that way. But you don't. What actually happens is you procrastinate more. um, As soon as one project gets difficult, you just bounce on to another one. So the idea here is um, on the level of tasks, it might just be to sort of select three tasks from your infinite to-do list and and not allow yourself to turn to any of the others until you've done those tasks or you've done one and freed up another slot to say it. There's only ever going to be three that I'm, that I'm focused on. Um, And these other things that feel urgent are going to have to wait because these trade-offs were happening anyway. It's just that this is a way of making them, them conscious or another way of doing this at the level of sort of big projects is to say, I'm, I'm not going to tackle more than one major goal in could be in your work and at home, could be in the main areas of your job. There's also different ways to slice and dice it, but it's it's just ways of sort of forcing 95% of what you feel like you need to do to wait in a queue behind one or two things that you're actually going to focus on and, and get done. And to sort of, again, live with the slight anxiety that that, that, that triggers, um, because uh, you know you, your your time and your attention is finite, and it always was finite, even when you were multitasking or thought you were multitasking. So again, it's just a way of sort of coming back down to earth and 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 confronting the reality of the of the situation. Yeah, it's consistent, I think, with some of your earlier work, if I'm remembering correctly, around around things like exercise and so on, which is if if you wait until you feel like doing it you'll probably never do it the point is to do it even when you don't feel like doing it and i think the thread here is the idea of becoming more comfortable with discomfort or perhaps that doesn't work but becoming more aware of the inescapable fact of discomfort and so as i'm focusing on those three things those the I, I'm going to try and do this myself, Oliver. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you and see how it works. Because I, I've, I've, curr- I've currently got 87 things, major, major projects underway or whatever it is. Right? <laughs> and, I, and that's how I, you know, I recognize that, that problem in myself. And I, and I just, it's like whack-a-mole. Mm-hmm. It's like if you just do a little bit of each. Um, I guess the idea is I know I'm going to be uncomfortable about the 83 things that I'm not doing mm-hmm. because I'm focusing on the three. And you're saying, yes, you are. But you, it's a better, to, it's a better kind of discomfort, because you can recognise it and then move away from it, like meditation in a way. You sort of feel the distraction and then kind of move away from it. So yes, you're still going to have those things. Are going to, it's not like I'm going to forget about the other things, but this will allow me to focus on the three rather than bashing eighty six at once. Right, and like one of those routes is a kind of hyper anxiety of like I'm going to stay on top top of everything, and the other one is just a sort of a kind of slightly tragically infused recognition that like this is how this is what it is to be to be human right and so there's something sort of um there's something sort of more authentic about the the 
the suffering of uh, leaving those tasks, even though they are crying out to be done, than there is about working yourself up into this kind of like, oh, I'm really what I'm doing is I'm I'm getting to the state of of um, limitlessness because that is that's uh, that's fake, that's a fraud. Yeah. Mm. Well, the irony, of course, and I'm sure you've heard versions of this in other interviews, is that whilst we've been discussing time, I've been trying to keep an eye on time and especially to be respectful of, of your time. You have a lovely line in the book where you suggest that rather than us think about using time, we should sometimes think about allowing time to use us and to be in the moment and present and so on. So I, I don't know if we've been using the last hour of time or a, I hope at least a little bit allowing time to use us. I think so. In the exchange I've, that we've had. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation and it went in directions I wouldn't have expected. So I think those two components together point to point to letting time use us a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely. Yeah. yeah. So let's, 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 let's um, be grateful to the, the hour that allowed, uh, uh, that, that used yes, us yes. rather than us just using it as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Oliver, for coming. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time. <laughs>